Book of Mormon Prophecy, a podcast series by Avraham Gileadi, Ph.D. 6. We Ephraimite Kings and Queens What does it mean for Latter-day Saints to serve as kings and queens? Who are the spiritual kings and queens of the Gentiles who restore the house of Israel? Welcome everybody, this is podcast number six. It's called Us, Ephraimite Kings and Queens. Now I'm going to discuss some scriptures again. You know, I have a saying that if you can't show it, don't say it. You know, everything that I say is backed up with scripture. It's the way you put these scriptures together that paints this picture. Like a continuity, a pattern, is how things follow. As part of searching the scriptures, is to make these connecting links between different scriptures that sheds light on what the scripture is actually saying. From 2 Nephi 6, verses 4 and 6 and 7, the Gentiles, kings, and queens nurture Israel. I promised you that we'd discuss that last time. The role of Gentiles, us, kings, and queens. Again, it's the spiritual kings and queens who may have been ordained to be spiritual kings and queens in the house of Israel and so forth. And that's very important. Those are part of the covenants of the Lord that the Lord restores. But if we don't live up to them, what's the use? The Lord will have no use for us. Otherwise, it's in name only, like Latter-day Saints. is in name only, right? We're saints. We want to be saints. But really, saints means sanctified ones. When we're truly sanctified, then we're saints by God's definition. He says, I will read unto you the words of Isaiah, and they are the words which my brother has desired that I should speak unto you. This is from Jacob, Nephi's brother. And these are the words. I will lift up mine hand to the Gentiles and set up my standard to the people. And the King James translates this standard. Hebrew is ensign, ness. Unfortunately, the King James translation of Isaiah, even in the Book of Mormon, translates it three different ways. Ensign, standard, and banner. But it's the same one word in Hebrew, ness. Ness means ensign. I'll lift up my hand to the Gentiles, that is to us, and set up my standard or ensign to the people. And this is a worldwide event when it happens, and you have to go into Isaiah more deeply to understand who or what the Lord's hand or ensign is. And it's not what we've supposed. You've got to get the Scripture's definition of it, right? And they shall bring your sons in, your, in their arms, and, and thy daughter shall be carried upon their shoulders. That is the sons and daughters of the house of Israel, whom the Gentile kings and queens gather to Zion from their dispersed state and from their captive state in the end time, at the time destructions are coming upon the entire world, as we saw in our previous podcast, and we'll see again. And kings shall be thy nursing fathers, and queens thy nursing mothers. They shall bow down to thee with their faces to the earth, and lick up the dust of thy feet. Hmm, that doesn't sound very pretty. Are these kings and queens going to do that, really? If they're spiritual kings and queens who are doing their job, why would they lick up the dust of these people's feet? Right, that's what we're going to answer here. Just remember that, because we're getting into Isaiah where he's actually quoting from. Jacob is quoting from Isaiah 49, verses 22 and 23, which are again quoted in 1 Nephi 21, 22 and 23, 2 Nephi 6, 6, and 7, and 2 Nephi chapter 10, verse 9. So this is something, the scripture from Isaiah is something really important to Nephi and Jacob and in general to the, to the Nephites because it concerns their descendants in the end time. They're very concerned what's going to happen to their descendants. Wouldn't you be if you knew they were going to apostatize? What's going to happen to them in the end? Okay, so this is from Isaiah now, from the Isaiah Institute translation. Thus is my Lord Jehovah. I will lift up my hand to the Gentiles, raise my ensign to the peoples, and they will bring your sons in their bosoms and carry your daughters in their shoulders. Kings shall be your foster fathers, queens your nursing mothers. They will bow down before you, their faces to the ground. They will lick up the dust of your feet. All right, so we still have this riddle. Who's going to do the, the carrying, you know, to safety, to Zion? 
And who's going to do the licking of the dust? Aha, we're going to answer that now. Because in 2 Nephi chapter 6, verses 12 and 13, Jacob, Nephi's brother, plain starts explaining some of this. The Gentiles unite with the abominable church. Uh, so some of us are going to apostatize. And actually, you know what happens to apostates? You've seen it, right? In history, they get worse than they ever were before they became members of the church. So they are going to cause trouble and try to stop this work and are going to fight against Zion, as it is here. Blessed are the Gentiles, that is, the Gentiles who repent. Notice the two choices that we have. We as Latter-day Saints are these Gentiles. Blessed are the Gentiles, they of whom the prophet has written. That is, the fullness of the Gentiles, or the descendants of Ephraim, who assimilated in, into the Gentiles, which we are, and have now have come out of the Gentiles, so to speak, to reclaim our heritage, our spiritual heritage, as members of God's people. They of whom the prophet has written, for behold, if it so be that they shall repent and fight not against Zion, well, that's it. Repent of what? Number one, of our worldliness, for goodness sake. Of all our trappings of Babylon that we're surrounded with. We're immersed in the culture of Babylon, and we don't even know it. So we have a lot to repent of. Start reading the scriptures, and you know, you see the contrast between then and now, about when God's people were pure and righteous and holy, and now, where our ways are so worldly and focused on our wealth and our cars and our houses and on our beautiful things that mean nothing in God's plan. What it means to God is whether we're doing our role, whether we're ministering as we ought to the house of Israel in, in our day. So if it be that they shall repent and fight not against Zion, which others of us are going to do, those who don't repent, of course, and do not unite themselves to that great and abominable church, as many of us will do. They shall be saved. That's the ones repent, right? For the Lord God will fulfill his covenants, which he has made unto his children, and for this cause the prophet has written these things. Wherefore, they that fight against Zion and the covenant people of the Lord shall lick up the dust of their feet. So what is this telling us then? Just summing up here. Very clear. There are two kinds of Gentiles. The loyal ones of Ephraim who repent and fulfill their role as spiritual kings and queens to the house of Israel, to God's covenant people, the Jews, the ten tribes, and Lehi's descendants, and others who are going to fight this work who don't repent. You see the situation today, how there's such a polarization of people in the world, and you can't convince them either way anymore. They are so set on their course. They won't even listen to the other side, not even consider what they're about. They don't consider whether anybody's right or whether it's good or evil. They are so set on their course that once they become apostates, they lose the light and are so focused on their own agendas and become very destructive to society and seek to vent their wrath upon others to make them their scapegoats for their guilt and so forth. So that's what's going to happen to us, how sad that's going to be, and how, how much that would sadden the Lord, whose church this is. He must now even be shedding tears of sorrow for the things that are happening among us today, especially for the younger generation, just deserting the church en masse, and is going pell-mell after the things of the world, and losing the light. Next we're going to read from 1 Nephi 22, 8 and 9. A marvelous work among the Gentiles, because this restoration of the house of Israel truly is going to be a great and marvelous work. And that, by definition, is the great and marvelous work that the scriptures talk about. It is not the restoration of the gospel and the priesthood through the prophet Joseph Smith. As I mentioned, in, in contrast with this great and marvelous work that the scriptures define, the restoration of the gospel and priesthood is called the beginning or the commencement or the foundation of, of the great and marvelous work but not the great and marvelous work itself. It was one of the precepts of men we've grown up with, thinking that that was the, the great and marvelous work. Remember the book, A Marvelous Work and a Wonder? It got it wrong, plain and simple. It's not scriptural. And after our seed is scattered, the Lord God will proceed to do a marvelous work among the Gentiles, 
which shall be of great worth unto our seed, wherefore it is likened unto their being nourished by the Gentiles and being carried in their arms and upon their shoulders. And it also shall be of worth unto the Gentiles, and not only unto the Gentiles, but unto all the house of Israel, unto the making known of the covenants of the Father of heaven unto Abraham, saying, In thy seed shall all kindreds of the earth be blessed. So here very clearly it defines the great Amal's work as the restoration of the house of Israel, which the Gentiles do. They are the ones who restore the Jews and the ten tribes and the Lamanites in the end time. So the more we learn this, the more we get habituated to thinking, hey, this great and marvelous work is still waiting upon us to do our thing, to fulfill the agenda that the Lord has given us. And some of us need to be thinking of those things and not of our worldliness if we're going to get it right. You know, just the same as the Lord was waiting upon Moses and upon other prophets of God to do what they did in order for the Lord to progress in his work upon the earth. So he's waiting for us today. Of course, it's not going to happen until the Lord's arm is going to be revealed, but we can be starting to think about what this is all about, preparing ourselves for those things that are soon to come. And the house of Israel gathers from the four parts of the earth in First Nephi 19, 15 through 17, and basically quoting Isaiah 11, verses 10 through 12. When that day cometh, says the prophet, that they shall no more turn aside their hearts against the Holy One of Israel, then will he remember the covenants which he has made unto their fathers. Yea, then will he remember the isles of the sea, and all the people who are of the house of Israel will I gather in, says the Lord, according to the words of the prophet Zenos, from the four quarters of the earth. Yea, and all the earth shall see the salvation of the Lord, saith the prophet, every nation, kindred, tongue, and people shall be blessed. So the Lord is going to remember his covenants. And for goodness sake, we're going to have to remember these covenants because the Lord is going to use us, or is waiting to use us, to fulfill them with his people. And who's going to do this? Well, that's, that's why it's so important to get a correct idea of what our roles are. And we as Ephraimites have that principal role in the end time scenario that Isaiah and the prophets speak about. The tribe of Joseph is the birthright tribe, as we see from 1 Chronicles 5.2. Judah prevailed above his brethren, and of him came the chief ruler. But the birthright was Joseph's. But guess what? We're not only the sons of Ephraim. You know that the lineage of Christ and the apostles also assimilated among the Gentiles. And so we have a very special lineage there that many Latter-day Saints have who are descendants of all these lineages. It came mostly through the kings of Europe, and are still doing so today. And so we're both Ephraimites. We may be pure Ephraimites, as the prophet Joseph Smith was, but also have the royal lineage in us. And it is a chosen lineage that combines the two roles of both Judah and Joseph in us today. Let me read from Jeremiah 17, verse 25. End time kings from the house of David. There shall enter the gates of the city kings and princes sitting upon the throne of David, riding in chariots and on horses. Of course, they will do so in the Old and New Jerusalems because these are the royal lines of Israel, kings of the house of David, through the lineage of Christ and his disciples, the apostles particularly. We have that special lineage, that divine lineage in us, encoded in our genes. and. If you were to find out more about it, you would probably recognize that that would be the lineage of the 144,000 servants who are the same kings and queens we're talking about, as we'll be discussing later. If you were the father and you wanted to bless your son, the savior of the world, with a special lineage in the end time, as he is doing, how would you do that? Wouldn't you think that they would be his lineage too? even though they're assigned to be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel and are to be, you know, like the 12 apostles were assigned to be judges over the 12 tribes of Israel. So they'll be thrown, set up in the millennial age all over the world, 144,000 of them. And don't you think that they 
would have the descendants of Christ sitting upon those thrones? Wouldn't that be a way the Father would honor his Son that way? Making sure those lineages pass through all the way to the end time? Yeah, think about it some more. You'll see. And you can see the scriptures, too, that talk about these things. And many of the early brethren of the Restoration also talked about those things, as you read in the Journal of Discourses. Right now from Genesis 35, 10 through 11, we're going to read about God promises kings from Jacob's lineage and from Abraham and Isaac's. God said to him, Your name shall not be called Jacob anymore, but Israel shall be your name. Now that is what happens every time we ascend a spiritual level that we receive a new name. Not just once, but each time. And we're also given a new role. Because Jacob at that time became father of the 12 tribes of Israel. And he called his name Israel, ruling with God. And God said to him, I am God Almighty, be fruitful and multiply. A nation and a company of nations will come from you, and kings will come out from your loins. Okay, so these, these are the kings that were promised Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Is us. Gentiles, Gentile kings and queens of the lineage of Ephraim who restore the house of Israel, the other tribes of Israel. What a beautiful thing that is. How could we receive a greater promise than that? Right? And I read in 2 Nephi 10, verses 7 through 9, the house of Israel believes and gathers. When the day cometh that they shall believe in me that I am Christ, then have I covenanted with their fathers that they shall be restored in the flesh upon the earth unto the lands of their inheritance. We read a similar scripture before that. It's all part of the restoration of all things. And shall come to pass that they shall be gathered in from their long dispersion from the isles of the sea, from the four parts of the earth, and the nations of the Gentiles shall be great in the eyes of me, said God, in carrying them forth to the lands of their inheritance. Yea, the kings of the Gentiles shall be nursing fathers unto them, and their queens shall become nursing mothers, Wherefore, the promises of the Lord are great unto the Gentiles. You see how often they keep repeating the same thing in different ways, in different places? This is really important to them. It's key to, their, to the whole outcome of things in the end time and what happens to their lineage. They are so concerned about that. So, number one, first of all, their descendants believe in Christ. How will they do that? Well, because we will minister the gospel to them when that Arm is revealed in the, in the own due time of the Lord. We will do that. And secondly, they will then be restored in the flesh, that is, gathered from the four directions of the earth in a new exodus to Zion. And we will be leading that exodus for them. That is what the scriptures say. The more you investigate it, the more real that becomes in your mind. Because it's all there. And now from Isaiah 60, verses 3 through 4, I'm going to. Talk about end time kings again restoring the house of Israel. Nations will come to your light because the house of Israel is going to come out of all nations. And there'll be all kinds of people. But these are, will be mostly ethnic lineages of the house of Israel, whom the Lord has scattered throughout the world. Nations will come to your light, their kings to the brightness of your dawn. Lift up your eyes and look about you. They have all assembled to come to you. That is, speaking to the woman Zion. Your son shall arrive from afar, your daughter shall return to your side. So these kings are bringing Israel home. Well, not just Israel in general, but the elect of Israel, as we'll find out, because according to Isaiah, the term sons and daughters of God is a special term that defines God's elect in that day. As Jesus also says in Matthew 24, he will send his angels and they will gather his elect from the four quarters of the earth. And who are those angels? Well, they are translated beings, or resurrected beings, possibly. Certainly, 144,000, and these kings and queens who are the same. We'll be getting into that more and more and more, so this picture that the scriptures paint will be solidify in our minds and in our hearts, very solidly, all part of the great end-time scenario. And then we're kind of given an ultimatum here in the Doctrine and Covenants, section 103, verses 9 through 10 will be the saviors doing this restoration of the house of Israel, or will be a salt that is not its savor. How about that? It says they were set to be a light unto the world, that is us, to be saviors of men. And that is according to the terms of the Davidic covenant, which is 
what the kings and queens do. We don't become saviors of men according to the terms of the Davidic covenant and serving them as kings and queens, then we'll be as salt as lots of savior. Basically, a lot of these saints in this end time scenario are given these two choices. Either we do that or we're out of here. We'll be among those who fight against Zion and join the great and abominable church and lick up the dust of their feet. And as much as they are not saviors of men, they are salt as lots of savor, which is thenceforth good for nothing but to be cast out and trodden under foot of men. And that's it. And that's not very pretty. So which one do you want to be? Right? That's the question today. So on summary, summar summarizing things, the Gentile spiritual kings and queens restored the house of Israel to God's covenant and to lands of inheritance in fulfillment of the prophecies. The time frame is the time of Israel's restoration right before the Lord's coming to reign upon the earth. And moving forward, will Ephraim take on his end-time role of savior to the house of Israel? That's the big question presented to a lot of these saints, facing a lot of these saints today. Next time, how does understanding Isaiah help us to understand the Book of Mormon? As I mentioned before, if you understand Isaiah first, and then come to the Book of Mormon, you will understand Isaiah and the Book of Mormon, and how the Book of Mormon uses Isaiah to predict this end-time scenario of Isaiah and that they have seen in vision, which is one of the same, of course. Now, I strongly recommend reading or listening to this book of mine, one of the recent little small books called Becoming Kings and Queens of the Gentiles. It pretty well tells you what it is. It pretty well tells you all the scriptures relating to our role as Latter-day Saints if we're going to become these spiritual kings and queens. It's all scriptural. It's all based on the scripture. Scriptures in the Isaiah, Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenants, wherever you find them. Thank you very much. I hope you enjoyed listening to this. and. We'll catch you next time. Thank you for joining us today. Join us next time when we learn Isaiah, Key to the Book of Mormon. How does understanding the words of Isaiah help Latter-day Saints understand the Book of Mormon? Have we missed many central truths by not doing so?